Wonderful. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open to the book of Psalms. The Psalms chapter number 25. Psalm chapter number 25. I started to preach the Sunday morning service, or Sunday morning message that I had, and uh, the Lord just kind of said, no, that's Sunday morning, so you need to preach a message that I've asked you to tonight, and so if you would please take your Bible and open to Psalm chapter number 25. Psalm chapter number 25, the beginning of the chapter, David is giving some insight into what he is going through, some of the events that have taken place, and some of the things that has happened in his life. He is then... uh, Telling it, and, and the truth is, uh, the first portion of the, the chapter uh, has a song that goes with it. I was just reminded of that when uh, I glanced at the, uh, the beginning of it. And uh, the, the truth is, we probably ought to use this for, a, uh, uh, for one of the opening choruses. And uh, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my, uh, do I lift up my soul. And uh, it's kind of interesting because it's a repeat type song. And it begins, unto thee, O Lord. And then the next, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Just like that, unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul. Then verse number two, O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not mine enemies triumph over me. All right, I won't trick you. How many that's the first time you've heard that? <laughs> okay, good. And, uh, and of course, there's other verses that we uh, add to it through this chapter. And it just uh, helps, of course, to re- memorize Scripture, but it helps you to remember that there's some very good things in God's Word that is reminding us of that. As David is now reflecting somewhat, he is... Uh, Uh, comes down to verse number 14. And I want you to notice something, if you would, please. It said, the the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. So is there a secret that God keeps? Is there something that he does not reveal easily? Is there something that is not easily just understood or seen immediately on the surface? The answer to that, of course, is yes. Yes. Because he makes it very clear that he does not, and I I don't mean this unkindly, and it's not meant to be, but it's straight from Scripture. He even reminds us not to cast our pearls, those of great value, before swine that would have no care for what is of a quality thing and what is a uh, quality type of uh, commodity. God has the very same thing. Part of that is wisdom. Wisdom is, in Scripture, is reminding us, is like a deep well. In other words, it must be drawn out. It is not just gushing out for everybody to have. It's available. But because wisdom is something that is a very precious commodity, and it is somewhat of a consumable commodity, there are benefits from it, and there's residuals from it, but God oftentimes says that wisdom is for a particular purpose, and I will give that to you for that purpose. Now, as I said, there are some residuals that you will hang on to and that will be a benefit to you. Those are part of the reproofs of life that you learn from. But here God is saying this because David understands very clearly that there are certain things that God keeps to those that are really interested in finding out more about him. Because he goes on to say and answers that very thing, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. In that instance, so I want to talk to you tonight for just a few minutes on the thing of he will show. He will show. In other words, there is an availability of something that God wants to reveal to you and I that is not always on the surface, but is oftentimes a a little bit behind the curtain, so to speak. And lets you see the mechanics of things, lets you see the operation of things, and lets you see how things are made. (laughs) <laughs> I've oftentimes heard, now I've, I've eaten a lot of hot dogs and I've eaten a lot of bologna. I have. But I've been told that if I see how it is made, I may refrain from eating it as much as, I, as I'm relatively able to now. Uh, there's some things that are just not pleasant to see. There's some things that are sometimes you're grateful that you don't see them. 
We go into the sanitized uh, grocery store, well, at least it's supposed to be. And what I mean by that is you'll go over to the meat counter and you'll look through that and it's like, oh, this looks good, this looks good. But if you saw what the butcher saw, you may not think quite the same way. Because it does not always, once it hits that, that placement there and the plastics over it and things are straightened up and cleaned up and uh, it, it is something that it's like, oh, okay, well, that looks good. But you did not see what the butcher had seen with everything that was on the ground, the things that were discarded and the, the mess that is all over his apron. Because in that instance, as we have read in scripture, oftentimes there would be sacrifices. Now we think of a sacrifice as something that is offered up to God, but you understand the, the Levi people of that day and the high priest of that day, for the most part, I don't mean it unkindly and I don't mean this to, but they understood some of the ugliness of having to kill an animal. They understood that. They understand the, the draining of the blood. They understood the, the removing of the, the outer skin and things of that nature. Those are not always pleasant things, but they understood what that sacrifice meant and all the work and effort and what was being given by that. And in that instance, God says here, there are secrets that he has that allows you to begin to see them, some things. I, I know that one of the uh, things that I like to like, the, I like to see the mechanics of things, I do. I like to see how things work. Uh, infamously, when I was growing up, I loved to take things apart, loved to take them apart. And uh, because I wanted to see how they worked. It did not excite dad too much because oftentimes he'd have to put it back together. And uh, dad was a machinist and so he was very good at that. But, uh, you know, if something was broke, I want to tear into it and find out why it was broke. And uh, in that instance, it uh, has benefited me some uh, in my life's work, but uh, just making sure things are fixed. <laughs> uh, now, when, one thing that I like, I like the fact that Jesus gave us ice. Not, not, not to drive on, but to put in the refrigerator. I just do. And, uh, and my family knows, you know, Mrs. Whitworth, she'll drink water and she wants it right out of the faucet. And that's fine. I don't, I don't you know, I'm not going to wrestle with that. But uh, the truth is, I like ice. I just do. And uh, the ice maker that's been in our refrigerator, I have taken apart, I know at least that many times, and fixed it. Reason being is, I like ice. And, uh, and when I found out how it worked and the simplicity of the operation, it's like, oh, I can fix this. And so it has quit working. And when it quits working, all of a sudden, I don't have ice. Well, I want ice. So I pull it apart and put it back together. Uh, when vehicles break down, I want to pull it apart, find out why it's not working correctly, and then correct it. There's just that thing of making things work and making things operate. Now, some folks, they don't mind just throwing things away. It's like, let's get new. Let's get another. It's like, no, I want to get as much as I can out of what is here. I, I don't want to, I think it's, and I look at it like this. As I get older, I don't want folks to toss me out for a newer model. I want to say, well, I think he's got some, still some good work in him here. Let's make some repairs. And, uh, but in that instance, God says that there's a secret to, that he can reveal that makes things a little more interesting. Maybe you have watched some of the how it's made and things of that nature and how things are put together and how things are, are constructed and how things are functioning. In that instance, we see here that God has a little bit of some things along those lines too. But in that instance, he understands that one thing that will prevent that will be our own personal difficulties. And he knows that Satan is going to amplify those so that they keep you from wanting to reveal those, uh, keeping him from revealing those things. Because he says the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. In that instance, when we begin to lose respect for God and the awe that God has and some of the aspects of that, we begin to introspectively examine ourselves and therefore take the focus off God and focus on self. And, and by the way, that is one of the most shrewd uh, distractions that Satan uses. Because he reminds us, are you hurting? Yes, I'm hurting. Well, you need to focus on self. Hmm, it's kind of strange because scripture says, if you want to, he that findeth his life shall lose it. If you will begin to forget about the focus of self and start focusing on, on someone else, you've heard the little song. J-O-Y, J-O-Y's, this is what it means, Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. In that instance, God makes it very clear that sometimes when we stop focusing on self, and by the way, as I said, that is one of Satan's most shrewd distractions, because he knows that we're 
very much in love with self. It, it comes very natural. And it comes very, uh, very easily to us because we're worried about self. We're worried about who we are. Even in scripture, uh, the Bible reminds us that it, there's going to come a point where he instructs us as men, love your wives as yourself. And in that, it's like, well, because why? We love ourselves. We do. And in this instance, he is reminding if Satan can get us to stop focusing on God, in other words, that fear when we fear the Lord, it's a little bit, you, you can't, can't completely exchange it in scripture, but oftentimes if you, would, uh, if you would consider this, the secret of the Lord is with them that focus on him. We use the word fear, but it, it uh, has a tendency in one aspect to mean to focus on him and respect him and understand what he is trying to do. Satan's task is to get you focused off God. And if he can, he is going to get you to focus on self, something else other than him. Because, uh, and now we honestly think, well, I want to find myself. That has got to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my, in my life. All you're going to do is run around in circles. That is all you're going to do. He said, well, I, I just want to be me. I don't want you. You're, you're ornery. You're, you're, <laughs> the scripture says that there's nothing about us that's a good thing. And I, I know folks that honestly think they're, they're standing up for themselves when they say, I just, I just want to be me. And I, I don't want you to be you. You're not a good person. <laughs> you're not good. You need to be something better than what you are as a base model. That's why God wants us, he said, build on, on, on your faith and build on this and build on this. God wants us to grow in grace. He wants us to build on those things so that we become a, a much more productive and a better person. To stay at the base level is what, we, is what we were saved out of. Understand something, Jesus will always take you as you are, but he never leaves you where you're at. He is always trying to move you forward in the, in the walk of, of grace so that you become more like his dear son. And God is understanding very clearly. David understood this very, very, very succinctly. He said, if you focus on self, you're going to self-destruct. He says, because then Satan gets an upper hand. So he goes on to say, and, he, and he's reading down, and I'll, I'll read through verse number 25. Mine eyes are ever towards the Lord. Notice his focus. For he shall pluck my feet out of the net, turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I, have des uh, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of mine heart are enlarged. O oh, bring thou me out of my distress. See, David is understanding very clearly that if I'm not careful, I'm going to focus on self. And this focus of that introspection, examination, is going to constantly, that's why he looked at God and said, examine me. You examine me. I've done enough of it, and I'm messing up. So you examine me, Lord. So in this instance, he comes down and he gives four things in particular that helps you and I with this focus on God and being able to fear him. And in that instance, that keeps Satan at bay because if he gets us to focus on self, he has won by default because then we're not focusing on the Lord. We're not focusing on his aspirations. We're not focusing on what he wants for us. And so let me mention these four things, if I may, tonight. It begins in verse number 18. He says, look upon my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sin. The very first thing that is this, look upon my affliction, is basically saying this. There is some, something is troubling me. Or in other words, an inside influence. An inside influence. That inside influence is those things that could be a number of different things that you and I will face. It could be brokenheartedness. It could be over a, a family distress. It could be over something that, is, that has happened in your own life. And those instances oftentimes begin to help us to focus on self. Now, if we're examining to find out how we can improve, that is a wonderful thing. Oftentimes we're going to have to do it through the light of scripture to make that adjustment necessary. But sometimes there's the event where things take place. The problem is, is it's hard for us to look at self and think that there's an issue there. It's like, I'm perfect. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm just a nobody and nobody's perfect. In that instance, God knows very clearly that sometimes you and I need to understand that we're just made out of mud when it all boils down. And in that instance, uh, the only thing that we can offer is what the Lord has provided through grace and mercy. Look upon mine affliction, that inside influence, whether it's brokenheartedness, one thing that affects us uh, generally, and, and probably every last one of us, have felt the thing of loneliness at some time or another. Loneliness, we oftentimes think, it, now, we know that, that God is never going to leave us nor forsake us. We know that. 
but sometimes we want someone with skin on them. We just do. And sometimes that inward influence begins to make us ask the question, does anyone care about me? Does anyone care if I am ill? Does anyone care if I'm forgotten? Does anyone care if I'm... I, I was talking with somebody just the other day, and they made this comment. And uh, it, was a, it was a man, and he said, I'm only loved if I'm producing something. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, the second that I stop providing and producing something, my family will scatter like the wind. I said, what do you mean? He said, the, the only thing that they want from me is what I can provide. And he said, I am so lonely. And I said, I, I'm sorry about that. I said, I, I'm, I'm sorry that it, it seems as though that's the case. He says, it doesn't seem that. That's a truth. They've told me. And I'm thinking, the only, the only reason why his family stays is because he provides money. The only reason why they stick around is because what, they, what he can give to them. And I, I was troubled by that because I thought the second that he is injured or, and he cannot produce like he is, he'll be even more lonely. It was kind of interesting because uh, even the gentleman that Brother Caleb had led to the Lord a, a few weeks ago had mentioned some of those very same aspects about it. Now, he conjectured that he said, uh, you know, I've made my own poor decisions, and, uh, and it has brought me to this point. I understand some of that, but loneliness is something, not because, uh, look, you can be lonely in a big crowd. You can because you're wondering, is there anyone in the entire world that would care for me? Is there anyone that would... Now, and I, and I know, moms, they, they look down at the, the little children that are there, and they look in their eyes, and they love it when their children say, I love you. But eventually, those kids start to grow up. They just do. And pretty soon, they begin to have children of their own, and they begin to think, hmm, I wonder if my kids love me. <laughs> And of course, they, they usually do. It's just they, they have now begun to love others in that manner also. Brother Howes used to say all the time, I don't have to be at the top of the list. I would just like to be on the list. Because uh, as he traveled, things of that nature, he had even mentioned that uh, uh, there were times where he was, you know, seemed like very lonely and very alone. Sometimes he said, I don't know if anybody understands the burden that I carry. And so uh, he said, I, I feel sometimes a little lonely. He said, you, and he, he made the, the comment in pastor school many times. He said, when you guys are hurting, when you guys need help, who do you call? And every last one of them were thinking, we call you. He said, who do I call? You know, and sometimes we don't consider that. We just thought, well, he, he talks straight to God. That's what he does. <laughs> well, you and I can too. But sometimes it's nice to have that person with skin on them to be able to talk and, and, can, and be able to reflect with someone. Sometimes that inside influence are the things that trouble us. And we begin to get concerned and we begin to get uh, worried because of that very question. Who will care? Who will care? And uh, in that instance, everybody is cumbered about with what they're doing and things of that nature. And, uh, and by the way, let me say this. Every single thing that comes up to this platform, and it doesn't matter whether it cost a nickel or whether it was expensive, I, I never pick it up and take it without saying, Lord, thank you for the individual that thought about me in the process of, of getting this. Because as nice as it is, it is I, am, I am more moved by the thought of it than I am the actual, and I'm reminded of it every time I see it. It's a little bit like David as he was... He looked at the well there in Bethlehem and he said, oh, I'd love to have a drink from that well. Now, he was fighting a battle. The Philistines were surrounding that place. And some of his men said, if our leader wants a drink from that well, we're going to get it. The Bible says they fought through. They got a drink and they brought it back to David. And David was so moved because they, they cared and loved for him so much. He said, I, I, I can't drink this. And he poured it out as an offering unto the Lord. He, he, he valued those individuals and how much they cared for him a great deal more than just the water that was there. In that instance, David is reminding us even this. When he said, look upon mine affliction, he said, there's sometimes some inside influence that trouble me and bother me. There's some th And you can read through the Psalms and you find out, yes, there's many times that he's worried about enemies, he's worried about influence, but he's worried about himself too, getting at a point where he should not be. 
that inside influence, God knows very clearly that if we're not careful, Satan will get us to focus on self so much, we forget about the focus on him. And in that instance, look upon mine affliction. The secrets of the Lord, he will show and he'll reveal his covenant. But in that instance, he says something that will prevent that somewhat will be when we focus so much on self and that inside influence. But he goes on just a little bit further. The first one is that inside influence. The next one, verse number 19 says, consider mine enemies for they are many and they hate me with cruel hatred. The second one is uh, when he said consider mine enemies is those outside influences. Those outside influences that take up my time, that take up my thoughts, that take up, uh, and by the way, it doesn't matter how old you are, you can have a bully in your life. It really, I know we think about, well, kids are in school, they have bullies. Now, all of us may have had somebody that picked on us at one time or another. It would be kind of interesting. Now, some of you said, you know, I was always the bigger kid. I was the bully. <laughs> but uh, all of us have someone maybe that picked on us at some time or another. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, I was never terribly uh, big, but uh, I, had, I had folks, I've told you before, some of the ones that, that picked on me at times. And uh, it was kind of interesting, and I, I told you the, <laughs> one of the individuals that did. When I, was, uh, when I was growing up, I had a, look, I was probably, oh, I guess I, I just turned, as soon as I turned 16, I was going to buy a car. But you could, you could start working at certain hours when you were 15, as long as you didn't exceed too many hours in school. And I can remember that oftentimes uh, I would uh, at, I'd stay for maybe some type of sports uh, practice or then I'd go to work or whatever the case may be. And I would always walk down the, the, the same road because I had to walk home probably about two or three miles. And, uh, uh, but in that instance, uh, I would always walk down the street that I knew where my bully lived on. You said, what are you? <laughs> are, 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 what's the matter with you? Are you just not that bright? No, I'm really, I'm not that bright. But there was an ulterior motive to the whole thing. My bully, he smoked like a freight train. And, uh, and I, I was in relatively good shape in high school. And so he would holler because he would see me because I'd always kind of dilly-dally around there. And he was outside and things or out on the porch. And, uh, and I'd look up and he'd say something. And he'd come down like he's going to fight, so i just keep moving. And I could tell you his name. I can still see it right now. <laughs> I did it so many times. It was almost pathetic. And it's like, man, you're dumb. You just don't learn. And, uh, but, and so he would start chasing me. And I would run just fast enough where he couldn't catch me, but close enough where he thought he could. And uh, until he finally just almost keeled over, and I just went on. And I did that numerous times. <laughs> It's a good thing I guess I didn't trip because he would have caught me. But uh, in that instance, the uh, Lord's looking down and said, I know, son, you probably shouldn't have done that. And so I know, but it sure was fun. And uh, there was even a time that he actually had somebody waiting with him that was a little faster than he was. I, I could, his name was Mike. And I could, <laughs> Mike was the same one that a girl in school beat him up because he was picking on me. And uh, I, I, I think I've told you about Jody. But uh, I can remember Mike was up there on the, on the porch too, and so I came by. Now, Mike was a little faster than him, but I was faster than Mike. And so I did the same thing, except he, he could go just a little bit further than Harry. So where Harry was, oh, I'm telling names. I shouldn't tell him. To, uh, uh, but he was, well, Mike was able to keep going for a little bit. And uh, I just stayed ahead of him just a little bit longer until we finally got to the, the train tracks that were there, and he was out of gas. And I just went on. <laughs> I'm going to have to pay for that in purgatory, I'm sure, one of these days. But uh, those outside enemies, those outside bullies, those outside influences that sometimes trouble you and I and get our focus off what we need to focus on. Those outside, and how about this one? Authorities without mercy. Authorities without mercy. Those outside influences that sometimes just take our attention away from focusing on God. In the instance where we need to say, Lord, this is a time that I need to turn towards you and I need to make sure that I am asking you for the assistance and help and direction on how to deal with some of these things, we oftentimes begin to think. And if you're like me, you oftentimes think about, how can I get back? How can I get them back? Which is not a positive thing, it isn't. Because it took me a, a good while until I finally realized that when Scripture says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord of hosts. He has never lied. He has never faltered. He has never not done his job. 
And when you and I try to pick up the baton of doing God's job, we oftentimes make a mess out of it. Have you not ever heard of Abraham? Have you ever not heard of Jacob? All these individuals tried to do what they thought God needed to hurry up and do just a little bit and cause grief. Moses did the same thing, not because they were not quality individuals, they got ahead of God somewhat. And that outside influence finally got them to a point where their pride was saying, I'll get back at them or I'll... Moses, as he was angry at the people that he was leading, finally, you know, he smote the rock and it cost him a great deal. Now, did water still come forth out of the rock? Yes, it did. He was still able to care for the people that was there. Did they deserve it? Truth is, probably not. If there's one thing that the children of Israel could do, they sure could complain. And in that instance, uh, Moses let that outside influence now cause him to falter. There was a time that Abraham even lied. God had to come to an ungodly king and say, you did something you weren't supposed to do. Seems like some good men are men at best, huh? And those outside influences, and by the way, if those outside influences can influence those good men, they can influence you too. So in that instance, keep in mind that those bullies, those authorities without mercy, and just those negative associations that you may find in your life can sometimes take your focus off God and thereby keep him from showing you what he wants to show you and I. Not only those inside influences, not only the outside influence, but I want you to notice the very thing that he says next in verse number uh, 20. Oh, keep my soul. Now, the word here, soul, is the same word that you and I would use for our spirit. It is, not, it is not talking about your eternal soul that is going to live or die somewhere. It is connected somewhat to who you are, of course. But he's talking about that element where the thing that makes me who I am, it is not going to be, uh, you know, it, it's not going to be a determining factor on whether you go to heaven or hell. Of course not. But what he's saying is this, keep my soul. He's saying, help me with my attitude. Help me with my spirit. Help me with who I am and how I deal with things. That word keep is the very same word that is used in the, uh, in the garden where he tells Adam uh, to keep the garden. In other words, to protect it. So David is coming to God and he says, Lord, protect my soul. Protect my spirit. Please don't let me get into an environment where I'm going to be challenged in this manner. Don't put me in an environment where the confrontation is going to push me past my abilities. God, help me so that I can keep my soul in, in good shape. Please don't allow that. And he, he is asking God to keep him at a point where he keeps his spirit in good shape. So the question comes, how are you and I keeping our spirit in good shape? There are always going to be times that are, it's going to be poked at. There is always times that it's going, to be, it's going to be challenged. It's going to be challenged by good people. It's going to be challenged by environment. It's going to be challenged by circumstances. It's going to be challenged. It just is. So how are you going to conduct yourself when you don't feel like it? How are you going to conduct yourself when you don't want to be uh, on top side? That's why David is saying, Lord, I am vulnerable. I know that, and, and I, I, I can only conjecture here, I don't know. David was very good at keeping himself under control. He really was, but at the same token, you could see that he was at times very emotional because of his writings. David, if he got mad at somebody, I think could honestly have lifted a sword and, and hurt them badly. But we don't find him losing his temper like that in too many areas. And in that instance, we see that he keeps himself under control when he needs to. When he's troubled, for instance, one of the events that took place when he was living in Ziglag, and all of a sudden the enemies had come, and while they were off uh, raiding and, and somewhat uh, the Philistines, they, uh, they captured the, his children and his, and his wife and his possessions, and they took them away. When they came back, they, they saw the city was destroyed and ravaged. And the next thing you know, David says, what am I going to do? And his men, tired and weary from what they were doing, looked at him, and it says, it's your fault. We're going to kill you. I think they would have had a tough time doing it. I really do. And, uh, but uh, David had some very influential men around him and some very mighty men. I think I, I, I can only conjecture. I have no idea because David turned to God and God uh, was able to give him the strength to tell him, hey, fellas, I know you want to kill me, but let's pursue after them and catch them. God has already said that we will catch them and we will recover. And scripture says in the last book of 2 Samuel, and they did recover all. But in that instance, we see David now is saying, keep my soul, 
He's saying, if I'm not careful, I could lose it too. And if I lose it, I'm going to make a mess of things. And in that instance, we see, as he says here, Oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. He is making it very clear. I could, I could mess up and I could influence greatly. So help me protect my spirit. Help me protect my attitude. Help me protect my testimony, if you will. And in that instance, he is requesting that. And then lastly, I want you to notice, if you would please, in the very last verse. Now, in verse number 21, it says, Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. But then the last uh, verse that is here, redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. That last word that you and I need sometimes is that very thing, redeem, redeem. It means to bring me back up, bring me back up. To redeem means to, if things are going sour, God, please lift me back up. You are the lifter of all those that are broken. You are the healer of those that needs a healing. You are the physician that, that repairs. You are the one that lifts up. You are the one to, to, put, to lift up when everything goes wrong. And in that instance, David is reminding, I may be down now, as, uh, as Solomon put it, a just man may fall seven times, but riseth up again. So the redeeming is this. He's saying, God, please help me to, to put me back on topside when everything seems to go sour. When the inside influences are troubling me and the outside influences are troubling me, God, please help me so that my spirit is not damaged to a point where I lose testimony and I lose faith and I begin to lose influence. He says, so I can be redeemed and be back up where I can just pronounce your glories and pronounce your, and uh, I, I, like the, uh, I like the word glory because it means on display. He says, God, I can, I can bring you glory if I am able to tell people how great you are. By the way, sometimes at your lowest point is when God says, okay, now, do you feel like you're redeemed? No, I don't. Do you feel like everything's going smoothly? No, I don't. <laughs> do you feel like everybody loves you? No, not really. I think of Paul and Silas has been doing right. They have been proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The most honorable thing that could be stated, and if human breath could be, could, could be measured, it may be the greatest thing that could possibly ever be said. Our words, if they're going to be weighed, the gospel message may be that of greatest value this world could ever hear. Paul and Silas have been doing that. But because of that, the authorities have now caged them, chained them, thrown them into prison, beaten them at times, and tried to shut them up. In that instance, God says, you want to see something? So he wakes Paul up and asks him, do you want to see something? Yes, Lord, I do. Does everybody love you? I don't, I don't think anybody loves me. And even Silas is snoring over here. He's making a mess of things. Do you think the jailers love you? No, I don't. I think they would kill me in a heartbeat. Do the authorities love you? No. Do they love your message? No. Though it's the sweetest message that could be told or heard. Let me show you something. Can you sing? Well, not very well. We're, we've just ordered new songbooks, and so maybe that'll help me here in just a little bit. But uh, he says, well, start singing. He begins to sing. And as he begins to sing, God begins to shake that entire jail. Even to a point where the chains fall off and the doors swing open. The man that's outside that would have killed them if he could have, now is willing to kill himself because he knows that he'll have to face punishment. Paul has to actually stop him and says, don't kill yourself, we're here. The man bounds in and says, what must I do to be saved? I can imagine the Apostle Paul thinking, yeah. You really do know how to show up, don't you, God? And about that time, not only did he give them the ability to be free of that, he then gave them someone to lead to himself. And as Paul tells him the story of Jesus, tells his whole family the story of Jesus, now it is, it, it, and all the prisoners that were there are able to see how great and how big God is. God can show up. He can show you how big and mighty and able he is. 
But sometimes he has to go through some of these things and we have to remember. We have an aspect of this too. It may be at a time where everybody seems like they don't love you, as David is mentioning here. And it may be that the outside influences are troubling. It could be that the inside influences are troubling. It could be the fact that your spirit is down. But there comes a point where David says, redeem, bring me back up. And when God shows up, there is a great deal of redemption that takes place. It just does. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house today. Thank you again for the privilege that it is. Thank you again for your word. And thank you for the ability to be able to read it, see it, to examine it and draw close to it and just hang on to it. God, we do ask now that you'd please just help us to do your will. Help us to do what we should for thy sake. Thank you again for all that you do. But Lord, we do ask for your help now. With our heads bowed and with our eyes closed, the question comes tonight. How much do you want to see God? How much do you want him to see him work in your life, in your circumstances, in your family, in those surroundings around there? Well, sometimes we have to ask him, Lord, help me so that the inside influences don't hamper that. Help me, Lord, so, I don't, not, so that I'm not affected by those outside influences. Lord, I need help because my spirit sometimes is so vulnerable. I need your help. Because, Lord, I want to see the redemption that you can provide. And I want to be a part of that. I want to participate in that redeeming that you value so greatly. And in that instance, maybe your prayer tonight is, Lord, help me to be the Christian that I should be. I want to see what you can do with a life that is surrendered to you. If that's your prayer tonight, I ask you to do business with God. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. As the instruments begin to play, if God's spoken to your heart this evening, the altar's open. You may come and pray. Just do business with the Lord. <laughs>